Hey, what's up everybody? My name is Michael Levan, and in this video, we're gonna learn all about service mesh fundamentals, why they're important, how they work, and a few of the cons that even go with service mesh, because as we all know in technology, where there are pros, there are cons. So with that, let's go ahead and jump right in. So first things first, let's talk about what a service mesh is. Well, it helps troubleshoot latency, it encrypts east-west traffic, and it's used for service communication. So a service mesh inside and outside of Kubernetes has one primary purpose. It controls how different parts of an application communicate with one another. Although a service mesh is specifically for applications, it's technically considered part of the infrastructure layer. And the reason why is because a lot of what a service mesh is doing is sending traffic between services, which is primarily a networking component. So when we're talking about service mesh overall, we're talking about what it can do at a network layer and at an application layer. So number one, again, it helps troubleshoot any latency issues that you may have between pods, between services, between your applications that are running in Kubernetes. It encrypts east-west traffic, so service-to-service -service communication, because by default, it's not encrypted. And it's used for you know this overall service communication. Again, that's how it's able to send packets between services, is how it's able to encrypt those packets, all that good stuff. So there are some additional services to a service mesh and what they do. Load balancing is one of them. So for example, with some service meshes, they actually come with ingress controllers. So depending on the service mesh that you're using, you actually might not need a dedicated ingress controller. Kind of all depends on the overall architecture. There's some observability components there. So if you're using, for example, Istio, there's an open source UI of Istio where you can see how everything maps together in terms of services, pods, et cetera. So pretty much you get like a visual of what's happening inside of Kubernetes. So that shares some observability practices. And then there's all of this security in terms of authorization policies, TLS encryption, MTLS encryption, access control, and a few of those components are how the encryption happens between services. So let's break down three of the core service mesh components and how they ultimately all talk. Now the first is your control plane, and this is like the headquarters, so to speak. So it handles the configuration for the proxy. Uh, the proxy is a big part of the data plane, which we're gonna be talking about a little bit the encryption certs and configurations that are needed for the service to talk to each other. So again, this is like the headquarters. It's like the brain, so to speak. And then the data plane is the distributed proxy that's made up of sidecars. And again, we're gonna talk about that in an upcoming slide, but the sidecars are simply the helper container. So it contains the proxy information that tells services to talk to each other, which is <laughs> essentially what the core of a service mesh is doing. And then there's the external control planes. Now, something very important to understand with the control plane is, well, actually with service mesh in general, you're installing components for a service mesh on your Kubernetes cluster. So if you want that brain or the headquarters, so to speak, to be sitting on another Kubernetes cluster instead of the same Kubernetes cluster that your applications are sitting on, you absolutely can. And the way to do that is with an external control plane. So it's just like a regular control plane from a service mesh perspective. The only difference is it's sitting on a separate Kubernetes cluster. And speaking of sidecars, we, we you know kind of dove into this a little bit already, but they're used to provide basic authentication for an app. It's you know literally like the helper containers. It contains the proxy information to tell services to talk to each other and from an authentication perspective. All right, so here's a little architecture diagram of what a service mesh will look like. So say you have you know some microservices on the left-hand side, and then you have some microservices on the right-hand side. Now those microservices are sending information to the proxy, and that proxy is sending the information about the microservices to the service mesh control plane. And then the control plane is sending configuration information like certs, how the encryption should work, et cetera, to the proxy. And then in turn, the proxy is sending that information to the microservice. All right, so let's talk a little bit about why a service mesh is important. First, there are gonna be a lot of times where you have network latency issues, you know, whether you need to up the replicas on your pods or there's something happening in the service. There will be network latency just like there is for any environment and any application. And because of that, you need a way to troubleshoot it. Now out of the box with Kubernetes, other than just, you know, like overall logs from the API, there isn't a solid way to troubleshoot network latency. And that's where a service mesh comes into play. The next is you need security out of the box. 
pod to pod communication, service to service communication, it's all unencrypted. So somebody can sniff those packets easily and obtain the information that's happening, any keys that are being passed, any traffic that's being passed, et cetera. So with a service mesh, you don't have to worry about that and you can handle all of it with a, T with a TLS cert. And then you have communication resilience. And what service mesh does is it helps a ton with timeouts, retries, and rate limiting. So a lot of that is abstracted away from you with a service mesh and you don't have to worry about it, which is great. Just timeouts alone can be a major hassle to deal with as you know everybody knows from a networking's perspective. And then as we already touched on, you have the observability pieces for tracing and for alerting. And that's all again tied into your service mesh. And the great thing is, is that you know you could take those logs, those traces, those alerts, and you can push them into something like Prometheus, for example, and then have it alert for you. Now, with every pro is a con. <laughs> so, and, and you know, we got to talk about it because it's super important. So first, there's an increased complexity that should not be overlooked. Service mesh is a <laughs> very advanced level topic. It's not something that's just basic. It's not something that's just straightforward to set up. It's not something that's easily scalable. If you talk to any Kubernetes expert and you're talking about service mesh, a lot of the time they're gonna ask you, why do you wanna implement service mesh? And if the reasons that you wanna implement it don't mean that you need to actually truly implement a full service mesh, chances are a lot of people will say, okay, wait, wait until you're actually ready to do it. There is definitely a ton of complexity there. Next, there's another piece to manage. There's already a million pieces to manage in Kubernetes. You gotta ask yourself, do I truly need a service mesh? This is gonna be another piece of infrastructure in itself. It's probably gonna be another engineer to manage it in itself, depending on how large your environment is. The next is, you know what? Service meshes are very new. I've seen service meshes that were used maybe a year or two ago, like in late 2020, that have been completely revamped and when i say completely revamped i mean literally ripped out the controllers the operators the way that it worked the apis that it worked on and knew everything was implemented so a lot of people that were using it had to literally rip out what they were using in the service mesh and reapply the new service mesh so yes yeah, service meshes are still new i would argue that they are still very much in a beta, almost production level stage in terms of which one you're using because a lot of the components are still moving. So you gotta keep that in mind. And then the next is, you know what? There is increased latency from a networking perspective. Even though it does help you troubleshoot network latency, there is increased latency because again, you you're adding another layer because of those sidecar proxies. All right, so let's head over to the web browser and we're gonna show a few different service meshes that are pretty popular in today's world. All right, so first there's Envoy, and it's an open source service proxy and service mesh essentially. And a lot of tools actually use Envoy underneath the hood. But there are other solutions that are a little bit more fine grained and packaged up. The first is Linkerd. So Linkerd is incredibly lightweight, and I think that's why I really enjoy Linkerd. There's not a lot that's needed for it. It's pretty lightweight and you get the observability, you get the security, you get the reliability, all of that stuff without some different layers of complexity. Next, speaking of complexity, <laughs> there is Istio. Now Istio is an awesome service mesh. Istio is one of the service meshes that do come with an ingress controller, so you don't have to worry about that piece, but it is a little bit more complex. Now I'm not saying that it's you know not able to be done or anything like that, but it is certainly a bit more complex than for example, Linkerd. Now, if you're in the HashiCorp space and you use maybe Terraform or Vault or something like that, HashiCorp does have a service mesh and it's called Console. Now, there is two versions of it, which is really cool. There's the cloud version, which means you don't have to manage any of the underlying infrastructure, data plane, the control plane, it's all abstracted away from you, which is pretty awesome. And then there's also the open source version that is always free, but you do have to manage the control plane, data plane, external control plane if you need to, et cetera. But if you're already used to service meshes, it's not gonna be a big deal to use this one, but if you're not and you want a SaaS version of a service mesh, so to speak, you could definitely check out console. I, I personally like it. And with that, that's gonna wrap up our service mesh fundamentals. Hope you enjoyed the video and in the upcoming videos, we're gonna be getting hands on and really diving into this stuff from an ingress and from a service mesh perspective, from a hands-on perspective. Thank you so much for watching, really appreciate it, and we'll see you again next time.
Thank you.